Hey, it's Sean. And it's Bree. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 10. What? What? What did he what, what, what? And <laughs> in, <laughs> in this episode, we're going to talk about Black Creek Pioneer Village in Toronto, Ontario. And we are also going to talk about the Bytown Museum in Ottawa, Ontario. And for our paramedia segment, we are going to be taking a look at the 1999 film Stir of Echoes, starring Kevin Bacon, Catherine Erb, and directed by David Culp. Such a great movie. Yes, yes. I remember when I first watched it. I can't wait to talk about it. Me too. Me too. It's it's actually one. So this is going to bring me way back. I think this is my first movie that I got on DVD. One of the oh, first. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was just like in that transitional time between VHS and, and Blu-ray or, or not Blu-ray. Sorry. Um, oh, DVD. right. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, I've, I, you know, I've watched this movie many times throughout the years and um it's always been a very interesting movie and in how everything happens and, you know, all this information is coming together. But you know what? I mean, I am going to talk about something today that kind of struck me a little funny about it when I watched the movie. So we'll talk about that later on. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how's your summer going? What's been going on with you, Brie? I don't know. Tell me. Fill me in. Fill us in. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um. I haven't really been doing much. Well, I've been doing a little bit of traveling, as you can see on our our TikTok uh, um, yes, channel. Yes, uh, yes, been yes, posting yes. stuff that we've been stopping by and visiting. Yes. Um, been also planning some camping trips. And uh, Sean and I went away to uh, Kingston and yep. uh, did some stuff there. So you'll see all that on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Yes, yes, all over social media, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, definitely take a look at some of the stuff that we've done, um, because you can do it yourself. And there's some really interesting things out there. Um, mm -hmm. And That's things that do. we've learned. Yeah. So definitely, definitely, you know, uh, as we always say, invest in your uh, hometowns and stuff like that, especially if you have an opportunity mm -hmm. to see something paranormal. And then, of course, you got to tell us about it because you know what? That's what it's all about. We tell you, yeah. you tell us, right? It's we want to know. <laughs> it's a give and take, you know? That's right. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. That's good. And yes, our trip was really fun and interesting. And what about you? Yeah, I have, you know, hot weather. It's been oh, um, no. crispy out there and uh, just kind of enjoying it, working. Um, trying to get stuff done for the podcast to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making connections and bringing our <laughs> listeners new things and, you know, all that good stuff, working with our writers mm -hmm. and researchers and, you know, all that good stuff. So we're going to get right into talking about Black Creek Pioneer Village in Toronto, Ontario. So the history of Black Creek Pioneer Village was, it was previously known as Danziel Pioneer Park, and it's an open heritage museum, and it's situated in North York, a district of Toronto, Ontario. It overlooks Black Creek, which flows into the Humber River. It is a look at life in the 19th century Ontario, and it shows us how Ontario might have looked um, in the early to mid 19th century. It is a very regular destination for field trips for schools across the GTA. Um, I know I went there myself when I was in elementary school and uh, experienced that. I don't know about you, Bree. Did you did you uh, have a field trip there when you were in school? Yeah, I remember going there when I was in school. I think uh, my kids have gone as well recently. Well. Over within the last couple of years. Nice. And I, I know that, um, you know, my parents also have brought my niece and nephew there. So it's, uh, you know, as we've just said, it's a very active place. People visit there all the time. And mm -hmm. um, it definitely has a lot of really good information. So, again, as we always say, if you're visiting the area or if you live in the area and have never been, we definitely recommend that you check it out. 
Mm-hmm. But to keep going on with regards to the history, the village was opened in 1960 and it was actually run by the Toronto and the region uh, uh, conservation authority. Um, the, the late restoration architect by the name of Napier Simpson sent his entry prof- uh, professional career to raising awareness to the importance of the heritage and conservation of Pioneer Village. The village has over 40 19th century buildings and they are all decorated in the style of 1860. Uh, it is run by historical interpreters and craftspeople who are housed in the restored buildings. There are also historical reenactments and a variety of visiting craftspeople that use their traditional methods to create arts and items. Some of the buildings include the Danziel Barn, Old Period Houses, the Ordinal Strong Family uh, Farm Buildings, Water Powered Grist Mill, a uh, general store, blacksmith shop, along with many other trade shops, a hotel, um, a church, and a one-room schoolhouse. Many were moved from their original sites. Um, the large halfway house and Mennonite meeting house, some of them were rebuilt on the current site. The blacksmith shop was originally built by Nobleton in the 1850. Gunsmith shop was built in Bolton. Taylor Cooperage building was built in Paris, Ontario in 1850s. There's also a weaver shop that was originally um, in Tempress Hall, built in Kettleby in 1850, the Sons of Temperance. And the Rob the Robin Mill was relocated from Amaleasburg. The village is associated with the Canadian Museum Association and the Canadian Heritage Information Network and the Virtual Museum of Canada. So anyways, on with that, that is my history of Pioneer Village in Toronto. So I'm going to pass it over to Bree so she can tell us some history about the ghost. So staff members have reported what seems to be a mild poltergeist activity in the Burrick House and the original strong home. This includes the shuffling of feet, footsteps, and wrappings, and general feeling of uh, uneasiness when you're there. There's also the story of a guide, like one of the tour guides, stepping into the Burrick House, and she shone on shone the light in inside and saw a woman sitting on the couch in the room right there in the entryway. So the tour guide and the woman locked eyes and the guide panicked a little and looked away. Then when she looked back later, there was nobody there. They say there has been rumors that reports of women, sounds of sobbing and thumping noises going on, thought to be like a wooden cradle close to a wall or something like that. And it was a theory about a a woman who was mourning the loss of a baby. So I guess the cradle rocking it back and forth, kind of hitting the wall, making that sound. Uh, The cemetery near the back of the village, where the strong family members are buried, uh, has produced reports of balls of light and seen by at least two security guards. The Halfway House Inn, which is now a restaurant, was uh, known to one of the ghosts. Um, Her name is Lady in Blue. It said that her husband was having an affair and he had left her and now she's trapped in this house. And she's been seen in the upstairs ballroom and on the balcony. There's also been some reports of activity on the staircase as well. And that's about all I have for the ghosts of pioneer village interesting no that was really good um you know um i also know that they do have a ghost walk that Mm -hmm. um operates there as well so if you want more information you definitely definitely need to check that out they also have a game that you can play Tell us more, because I'm not sure what you mean. Here we go. It's called Black Creek Pioneer Village Nightlife. 
the one tour is called Ghosts of Black Creek Pioneer Village, and they take you on a tour. It doesn't say how long it is, but um, I'm pretty sure they're anywhere from, what, a, a, an hour to two hours? <clears throat> okay. And then the other thing that they have is called Where Dark Things Dwell. And this is actually a game and uh, that you need like a team of six people. I'm just going to click on it. It sounds like fun. I was talking to my, my son about this. So you're stopping in the sleepy village of Black Creek for a night's rest. You and your fellow travelers find yourselves trapped in ancient evil stirs. Black Creek is surely doomed unless you can lift the curse. Now it's up to you to save the cursed villagers, discover the great incantation, and stop the evil from rising before the final bell tolls. Guided only by your wit and your lantern, do you have what it takes to journey where the dark things dwell? So the six of you are on a team, and then there's people like that are part of the play. So they like are sitting in areas like a role playing. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's 90 minutes plus 15 minute intro and 15 minute outro. Nice. So yeah, definitely cool. something that you can get a group together and, and experience and, and uh, you know, have some bonding time together if you want to. I think that would be so much fun. <laughs> that would be so fun uh, for sure. Yeah. I'd probably be pissing my pants, but other than that, <laughs> I know Considering you're only guided by a lantern <laughs> right. at, you know, at um, uh, Pioneer Village. <laughs> so, anyways, but that was really good. Thanks for that. Um, I did not know that they had uh, things like that. So, mm -hmm. again, um, you know, as always, check out their website and um, see everything that they have to offer at Pioneer Village. Uh, as, you know, Doug Ford said, not going anywhere. So take a look. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to Bytown Museum in Ottawa, Ontario. The Bytown Museum is in Ottawa, Ontario, and is located in the Colonel By Valley at the Ottawa Locks of the Rideau Canal at the Ottawa River below Parliament Hill. Located by the Comrenesant Building, the Ottawa's oldest remaining stone building, it basks in a very detailed overview of the origins of Bytown and its growth into present-day Ottawa. It first opened as the Bytown Historical Museum in 1917 and was founded by the Women's Canadian Historical Society of Ottawa, a group of around 30 women whose plan was to advance the study of Canadian history and literature, and they also gathered a collection of artifacts and needed a permanent home for them as well. Mayor Harold Fisher declared the building officially opened in October the 25th of 1917. It was used for meetings and as a museum for the relics and souvenirs. Many Ottawa figures helped in the refurbishing of the space. Thomas Alhern provided appliances for J.R. Booth, redid the floors, and the government of the jail sent inmates across the street to paint and decorate the interior. The museum was the registry building from 1917 until 1954. In 1951, the women secured the lease to the Camaranacent, and they started the long process of preparing the building for the collection and the move. It was completed by 1954. It was temporarily closed from 1982 to 1985 by Parks Canada for restoration work. It was temporarily located to Wellington Street. The Historical Society of Ottawa was the management until roughly around 2003. At this time, the board of directors was established and then it was registered as a non-profit organization. The museum's permanent exhibition, Where Ottawa Begins, is on the second, floor, uh, the second and third floors of the building. The sound floor explores the history of the national capital region 
from the origins of European settlements in the area to the incorporation of Ottawa in 1855. The third floor continues the narrative by examining the development of the city of Ottawa, including social and cultural life of Victorian times the assassination of Thomas Darcy McGee and the building of the Parliament Buildings of Canada and the involvement in international conflicts. The temporary gallery and the community gallery are on the second floor and the third floor also houses the Day in My Life, a museum, uh, the museum and a children's area. So that's all that I have, which is quite a bit for the history of the Bytown Museum in Ottawa. So I'm going to pass it over to Bree for the paranormal history. So Bree, over to you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Alrighty. So it is said to be haunted by Mc Duncan McNabb himself. He was the previous supply manager. He has been dead for over 150 years, but they say that his spirit is the one that is the active spirit there in the museum. The museum is also known for cold spots and the sounds of footsteps that continue uh, to follow workers around and visitors. Uh, Glenn Shackleton, who is the owner of Ottawa's Haunted Walks, has also volunteered at the museum and has had some experiences. He says that one night, when he was closing the building a few years ago, he was setting the alarm. The door started to vibrate back and forth, first a little bit and then violently, like it was going to go off the hinges. So he turned and he asked the staff if they had seen it, but they were all ready on their way out of the building. So they ran out of the building because they had heard the sound of footsteps running towards them. <laughs> That's funny. The second floors host a collection of antique porcelain dolls and people have said to hear them crying and they may even wink at you. <laughs> Some people believe they are possessed by the spirit of dead children. I believe that is a possibility only because we've seen the stories about Annabelle, right? So, and people are terrified of that doll. <laughs> Some visitors have said that they have been pushed or grabbed or tripped from behind when alone. Uh, usually in the old money vault at the stairwell, at the stairwell, some have heard voices shout, get out, get out. One employee noticed a man sitting in the library after she closed up, she asked him to leave and with, and without a, you know, thinking about it, he got up and exited silently walking towards the door after he stepped outside the employee recalls she hadn't seen the men enter the museum when they were open in a small intimate building she would have seen him enter it she went on to ask how he got in and when she opened the door to look in on all directions and although it had only been a brief 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 moment he was nowhere to be seen There's reports of items moving on their own and strange experiences of orbs of lights that flash in the room. Uh, rumors are there is more than one ghost that haunts the building. There was an encounter with a Lieutenant Colonel John Bai who controlled a computer within the building while a staff member was using it. <laughs> That's funny. It brings uh, up his name again and again after the computer shut down and reboots itself on its own. He was an engineer that supervised construction of the Rideau Canal and the founding of Ottawa, originally known as Bytown. People also argue that the ghosts could be um, hundreds of Irish workers who died during construction of the canal. Uh, with hardly any ceremony and burying rit rituals, uh, bodies had often been disposed of freely. In 2004, a plaque was commemorated to mark their passing. They had often taken jobs due to obstacles they faced and suffered from illnesses, exhaustion, and hunger while working. Death rates were pretty high, and it is likely many spirits to be restless there. Aw, that's a shame. And yeah, uh, it that is. is all I have. Yeah, Sorry. that's really a shame, um, because mm -hmm. that's such unfair... Um, conditions to have to work in and you know just to provide for you know your life and and your family and you know stuff like that like i mean you wouldn't even know if you were coming home at the end of the day that's crazy yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
could you imagine like nowadays with the technology and nothing you know there was literally nothing how would people survive i heard somebody on tiktok the other day he was like i don't know how people used to use maps to find places to go like he was like i'm grateful for google because all i have to do is search it it up and go to wherever i want to go yeah and you know sometimes it's beneficial to know the 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 quote unquote manual way to do it because what yeah. happens you know I know in Canada we recently had um, an outage of one of our major carriers and it was a big deal there was a lot of um, things that were affected a lot of people's lives were affected and and the reason why I'm saying this is because you know it reverted a lot of people to original modes of the way that we did things you know you had mm-hmm. to have cash you know yeah. um you couldn't send a text message you couldn't call you know like you couldn't use your debit you know like it was just it was yeah. a lot of different things that that happened yeah. and it just reminds it's you yeah. how reliant on technology we become yeah it's true we do we all do yeah. rely on it a lot but anyways, thank you very much for that um, ghost uh, information mm-hmm. um, there was a lot for about this the one. Bytown Museum. Yeah, there was quite a bit. And um, it was very interesting and, um, and very informative as always. So we're going to move into our paramedia segment. We're going to talk about the 1999 film Stir of Echoes. The movie was directed by David Cope. Uh, it stars Kevin Bacon, Catherine Erb. As I said earlier, the movie was really well done, um, really well executed. Um, I feel that the director with the characters, they were realistic, um, everyday people. Um, And I think that's, you know, you know, when you can relate to um, these characters is, yeah, I could be that person or, you know, that's, that's what I do every day in my life, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that that makes it a little bit more believable. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But it starts with um, Jake, who is um, the young kid of Tom, who is played by Kevin Bacon. And the opening of the movie, he's, he says, you know, he has this line and, and he's just talking away. And he says um, something along the lines of what is it like to be dead? And that kind of sets the tone for the movie, I think, in that sense. And um, Oh, for sure. Yeah, starts off from that point. Um, you know, but then it moves into, you know, Lisa, who is a sister-in-law to Kevin Bacon's wife in the movie. And they're at a party and, she, and she's a witch and she can hypnotize people and all this kind of stuff. So she decides that she's going to hypnotize Kevin Bacon and um, basically opens a door um, that she wants him to be more open Um but, you know, as before that whole thing even happened, I was thinking as I was writing this down that um, he was already pretty sensitive to start in a sense. It was Not there, the f- yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, you could definitely tell by how he was feeling about his life and, you know, this and that, that he was f- very sensitive about those things. Mm-hmm. So um, I feel that when he was hypnotized, it just opened it up even further. Um, And one thing that I kind of wanted to talk about is when Jake is standing at the top of the stairs and he says, oh, you're awake now, daddy. Mm. And I thought, okay, so yeah, he's a, oh, so does he mean he's awake us and now he knows about what he's experiencing? So, yeah, when he touched his forehead, that's when he knew. Because remember when he meets up with the uh, firefighter? Was it a firefighter that was the funeral for later on? I think it was a cop. (gasps) Okay. Um, Well, the officer that was there, he immediately turned around because he was also sensitive. Because Christopher asked me, he's like, how did he know he was there and nobody else turned? I said, because they were both telepathically able to connect. So they sense each other being there. And that's why he turned around. And when the mother realized it, when he said, 
who's gifted because it's got to come from one of you. And she knew it wasn't her. So he obviously had it. The sister just brought it to the surface is what she did. Right. Right. Because, she, you know, I think she made him way too sensitive because he was getting, well, then again, it, it was suppressed for so long. So it's almost like, you know, when something's congested and it wants to come through, it's kind of yes. like that. You know what I mean, yes. where it's forcing its way out now because it's been waiting so long to come out. That's called festering, right? Like it just mm -hmm. kind of festers and then it kind of like almost like a volcano, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden it's, it has that moment and it gets released. Um, and I agree, like he had some pretty intense visions and that's even what I have here written on my paper is intense visions and messages. Um, and then with the babysitter, Debbie, with the, the color red, Mm -hmm. You know, that was kind of, you know, a sign that something was going on there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, also at the train station was a very transitional moment. Um, I think for everybody in this, in this movie. So I think, you know, as the bits and pieces were being put together, this was a transitional moment. Mm hmm um, and, and I think that's also, you know, when Frank and Tom's interaction, having that deja vu moment. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. We'll get more about that in a moment. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was almost like that's when the community started to unravel in a sense. Like little yeah. things would come out here and there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then Maggie started doing some legwork with regards to finding out what was going on because now she knew because um, Tom knew when her grandmother passed away before oh, right. she even got the call. Yeah. Right. So again, you know, that sensitivity was there. It was opened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I liked uh, how, it was when the the officer said to the mother, it's going to keep repeating itself until you listen to it. Yes. The ghost. Yes. So, you know, then the boy started communicating a little bit more. And then the father really started to see what was yeah. happening. Right. And putting the pieces together himself. And I'm right. sure like anybody who went through that for the first time probably looked insane. But in the end of it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you're trying to Truth figure out something, out. right? Mm -hmm. That you don't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. You only have like a sliver of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. another thing too um, was Jake's reference to the feathers. Oh, you know, right. I thought that was pretty interesting too. Yes. Um, and very thoughtful with regards to, to um, what ultimately took place. Mm -hmm. And when, no when he said it originally, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, when he first said it, I'm thinking in my head, because it's been a long time since I've seen it. So in my head, I'm thinking, what does he mean by feathers? What is going to happen? Yes. I've been trying to figure yes. it out. And you totally don't expect it to be that. And then you're like, oh, my God, that's what they meant. Yeah, that was yes, like and that's where I found it very <laughs> clever because I was like, oh, right. And even though I've mm -hmm. seen it a million times, you know, I, I like yourself, I forgot about that portion mm -hmm. of it. So you know it's funny. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, mine's a little, it's not about stir of echoes. It's kind of about the same thing, but a different movie where the little boy is gifted in the ring with uh, Naomi Watts and he's drawing yeah. pictures and he's predicting the future in all the pictures and nobody can figure out what his pictures mean until she starts investigating and figuring it out. And then all the pictures make sense. So he was talking, but nobody knew what he was saying because he was drawing it, which I found That's fascinating. True. I love how true. children try in movies, they show how children try to depict, how, you know, what it is they're trying to communicate to you when they can't use the words. And then on the other token, I wanted to bring up the fact that, uh, and I said I was going to talk about this earlier. So as I was watching it, I kind of went, why do I feel like I'm watching The Shining? <laughs> right kind of the same mm. idea crazy, just yeah. different place. well don't get me wrong practically every hollywood movie is is their version of what they think a suburban life is like right 
So they think a typical house with a, a woman and a husband and a child is what everybody has. Right. Right. But uh, I I mean, just the dream family, the boy and the girl. Right. Right. But just saying in general, because that's kind of what came to mind when I was watching it again, because I think because we just did the shining on the last episode and we talked Mm -hmm. about it. So I, I, it was just very similar. um, Some of the points, I'm not saying it was all similar, but just some of it was. So Mm. yeah, just want to talk about um, that. That's all. Was, um, did Kevin Bacon's character have, a drinking problem like Jack in um, The Shining? No. 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 Because, like, so I mean, it wasn't alcohol they, they related. Partied. His was they, more they partied, but it wasn't like everyday kind of thing. You know yeah, what I yeah. mean? And I they, they showed that in the movie. So, yeah. I think it no, was. No, I think the... it was his was basically, yeah, mainly mentally related, but not because yeah. of like ha- mental health issues. It was more. Of an awakening to flooding yeah. of, a, yeah. of an awakening. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. That was a good convo about Stir of Echoes uh, movie. So definitely, if you have an opportunity, you can check it out. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. If I you... believe Tubi has it. Uh, yeah, I think Tubi has it. Um, if you have Hoopla from the library, um, I believe they have it as well. Um, and if you subscribe to Plex, they have it there as well for free. But then there are other ways that you can purchase it and watch it. So that brings us to the end of another episode season three episode 10 thank you again for joining us on this episode and every other episode as well um we hope you are enjoying our social media presence um you know we would love to hear from you and uh you know for you to get in touch with us and let us know uh, what you would like to see on the show, or if you have a place that you would like us to discuss. So I'm going to pass it over to Bree so that she can get you in touch with us. Bree? Alrighty. So you can definitely reach us at our email at paranormalfilescanada at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at Paranormal Files Canada. We are also located on Instagram as Canada Paranormal Files. Those uh, locations, you can contact us via DMing. On TikTok, we are providing extra content and some pictures and videos of the locations that we are visiting. So definitely check out our TikTok channel, which is also Paranormal Files Canada. Well, thank you very much for that, Brie. Um, Please get in touch with us and uh, Let us know what you think of the show and um, what we can do with the show. We are always open to suggestion from our listeners because you are the reason why we are here. And I also wanted to say thank you as well because we reached our 10,000th download. So, yeah, that deserves another what? What? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so thanks to everybody that has downloaded an episode of the show. Um, Please keep supporting us. We love having you along for the ride. And uh, we look forward to putting out many more shows. So as always, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And don't forget to stay spooky. spooky.